My name's Mary, and I'm coming to you from the children's room of the Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. And we are continuing to read biographies of women for Women's History Month. Today, we'll be reading about Frances Perkins. The book is The Only Woman in the Photo, Frances Perkins and Her New Deal. The book was written by Kathleen Krull and illustrated by Alexandra Bai. It was published in 2020 by Athenaeum Books for Young Readers, an imprint of Simon & Schuster Children's Publishing Division. And Frances Perkins has a Maine connection as the Perkins roots in Maine go back a long way and her homestead is open to the public in Newcastle and that is where Frances Perkins is buried. Little Frances Perkins was shy. She couldn't speak up even when asking for a book at the library or a spool of thread at the store for in her cozy New England town. She was most comfortable around her grandmother who encouraged her to always keep trying. She would say, take the high ground. If someone insults you and when someone opens a door to you, go forward. So shy Frances tried her hardest in everything she did. Frances was quiet, but she was a watcher and a listener. She was sad to see young Irish immigrants being screamed at and chased by those who hated newcomers. She felt sorry that her best friend's family was not as well off as hers. Her parents said that if you were poor, it was your own fault. But Frances wondered. She couldn't stand the thought of children going hungry or being in pain and she couldn't see how it was their fault. She knew first aid and other kids turned to her when they were hurt. She followed her grandmother's advice and always tried to help. Frances was a thinker at a time when higher education for women was new. People feared that women's delicate bodies would suffer if their brains got too big. But her father saw how smart Frances was. He taught her to read at an early age and encouraged her to go on learning. In high school, she mastered tough classes, including Latin and Greek. She blossomed from a whisperer to a star debater. The point was always to challenge herself. Going to college meant the world to Frances, and a history course there shaped her future. The professor required students to observe the depressing conditions in the nearby paper and textile mills. Frances was horrified, especially at the small children toiling alongside adults. The experience opened her eyes to other injustices in America, like those she glimpsed as a child. But these were the days when nobody expected the government to do anything, she said. Frances ached to help. To do that, she realized she had to make her voice heard. Even when speaking made her uncomfortable, in speaking up, Frances was learning to lead. Against her parents' wishes, they preferred she'd start husband hunting. She moved to New York City and began working. A new way to help fight injustice called social work was flourishing there. The more she saw, the more she wanted to help. I had to do something about the unnecessary hazards to life, unnecessary poverty, 
It was sort of up to me. She started off delivering milk and food to starving children, getting landlords to give a break to those unable to pay their rent, and asking for donations. In dangerous neighborhoods, she defended herself with the tip of an umbrella. For these social justice issues to get proper attention, Frances believed women had to get more power. So she went further. She was a fierce fighter for women's right to vote. She spoke out about suffrage on street corners, bringing her own grocery crate to stand on. She honed her speaking skills, projected her voice, and used humor to deflect hecklers. After getting more education in social work and publishing her own articles on the subject, Frances kept working to protect others by taking a job gathering information on unsafe workplaces. She visited more than 100 bakeries taking notes, bread, donuts, and pies were baked in airless rooms with dirt floors. Rats nibbled on bags of flour, and cats had kittens on the counters. Dirty water instead of chocolate dripped onto pastries. Frances saw sick workers bending over the dough and coughing. Children huddled there with their parents because they had nowhere else to go. She wrote it all down in her report. And when she presented it to the New York's Board of Health, bakeries were forced to improve conditions. But Frances didn't stop there. Next on her list was fire safety. She inspected 26 laundries finding danger everywhere. This problem was urgent. It became even more urgent after one horrible day in 1911. 30-year-old Frances was having tea with friends when the group heard the clanging of fire truck bells and an unearthly shrieking. She lifted up her long skirt and ran toward the scene of a fire. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was burning, and the management, worried about theft, had locked all the doors. The factory employed Italian and Jewish immigrants, mostly women and girls in their teens and early 20s, and they were all trapped. The fire claimed a total of 146 victims. The youngest were only 14 years old. Frances was sick to her stomach and then outraged. To her, this was murder, a tragedy that could have been prevented. If no one else would become the voice of these women, Frances would try. Witnessing the triangle shirtwaist factory fire turned Frances Perkins into an activist, so intent on helping others that she was ready to enter the all-male world of politics. Former President Theodore Roosevelt was heading up a committee on New York City workplace safety. He'd heard good things about Frances as an expert investigator, so he recommended her to run the committee. She began taking the others on tours of work sites to view firsthand the dangers of greedy managers not protecting their workers. She studied the men she worked with looking for ways to overcome prejudice. 
Some men would never treat her as an equal. But if she reminded them of her, their mothers in her staid three-cornered hat, she seemed to have more success. Her intense study of how men acted was worth it. The committee agreed with her, and the modern fire precautions we have today, glass cases with fire extinguishers, fire exits, fire drills, and water sprinklers began to be required. The city passed the most comprehensive workplace safety laws in the nation. It wasn't long before Al Smith, the governor of New York State, rewarded Frances' hard work with her first big break in government. He appointed her to the commission that regulated workplaces across the whole state. She was tongue-tied for a moment, but she decided to accept. The job was not just a grand opportunity to make her voice heard on the issues that mattered to her, but it was so significant that it made her the highest paid woman to hold public office in the United States at that time. In her new role, Frances kept arguing for change, helping to pass dozens of laws that made New York safer for workers in copper mines, construction sites, and factories all across the state. In 1929, New York's new governor, Franklin D. Roosevelt, appointed Francis the state's industrial commissioner, overseeing more than 1,700 employees in seven cities. And soon, it turned out, FDR would need Francis more than ever when the stock market crashed on Black Tuesday October 29, 1929, it propelled the nation into the Great Depression. The country suffered as it had never, as it never had before. About a third of working Americans lost their jobs. Then many lost their homes. Francis visited encampments of miserable families living in cardboard boxes and tents. President Herbert Hoover kept making reassuring statements, predicting that recovery was around the corner. Frances was furious. She knew it was not, and she had to speak up, or else people would start blaming themselves for being out of work. In 1930, she called a press conference to announce that Hoover was wrong, and that she had the facts and numbers to prove it. Yes, Frances Perkins had just challenged the president. Telegrams and phone calls poured in to criticize her, but she said, I felt the satisfaction of someone who told the truth. In the 1932 election, Hoover was defeated in a landslide by none other than Francis's boss, FDR. And he wanted Francis as the Secretary of Labor in his cabinet of advisors. He was proposing a new deal, a fresh start for Americans in need, and she was a crucial part of the plan. At 52 years old, Francis hesitated. The challenge seemed extreme and as the first woman ever to join a presidential cabinet, she would face a storm of criticism. But her grandmother's advice sailed into her mind, and she knew what she had to do. The door might not be open to a woman again for a long, long time, 
and I had a kind of a duty to walk in and sit down in the chair that was offered, challenging herself and using her voice, she realized, would allow her to protect people across the nation and inspire women at the same time. So Frances decided she'd accept the job if FDR allowed her to do it her way. She'd been thinking up ideas for years. Now, she wrote all her requests on slips of paper, a to-do list for helping the most vulnerable. At their meeting, she held them up and she watched the president's eyes to make sure he understood what she was planning. The scope of her list was breathtaking. It was nothing less than a restructuring of American society. Their talk lasted one hour until he finally said, I'll back you. Newspapers had headlines like, Boston Girl, First Woman Cabinet Member, Frances Perkins, Hard Working. Sure enough, Frances was now one of the 10 most powerful people in government in the whole country. Her Department of Labor was in charge of all matters concerning American workers. On her first day on the job, she took control of her desk only to find the draws crawling with the largest cockroaches she had ever seen. It seemed a sign of how corrupt and inefficient the department had been. She rolled up her sleeves, scrubbed out her desk, and plunged into work, basically around the clock. At her first cabinet meeting, nervous about how best to make herself heard, Frances decided on a quiet approach. I wanted to give the impression of being a quiet, orderly woman who didn't buzz buzz all the time. As she had on her very first committee, she knew she would have to make the other men take her seriously. Finally, FDR turned to her with a smile. Well, Miss Perkins, have you anything to say, anything to contribute? She spoke briefly about her recommendations for reducing unemployment, and after that, the men treated her as an equal, sort of. Some men in her department did threaten to resign rather than report to a woman. Others acted like schoolboys and passed silly notes about her during meetings. One day she testified before Congress and a congressman remarked, she's an awful smart woman, but I'd hate to be married to her. When first Frances heard about the insult, she laughed it off, retorting that I hadn't asked him. She had a job to do. The first hundred days were critical. Frances had two phones on her desk and would sometimes answer both at the same time. Mostly, though, she was out of her office, initiating a blizzard of big moves an alphabet soup of agencies, the Civilian Conservation Corps, for example, but put more than two million young people to work, taking care of national resources, stocking rivers with fish, planting trees, and digging canals for flood control. With this and her many other undertakings, it was thrilling for her to see how directly she was helping people. 
Wherever she was, at steel factories, on the docks with shipyard workers in California, testifying before Congress, she was a voice for calm. Her goal was to establish a sense of security during a nerve-wracking crisis. She accepted every invitation to speak, feeling responsible for, for explaining the New Deal to the public. She met with FDR every 10 days or so. He liked to hear her advice in the form of a story. Who specifically was going to be helped? What exactly would be the result of the action she recommended? With a story he could then relay to others, he would always support her latest idea. Change was really happening. Magazine headlines hailed Fearless Frances. One called her the woman nobody knows, giving her full credit for the New Deal. In official pictures, she was usually the only woman in the photo. Her most far-reaching dream became a reality in 1935 when FDR signed the life-changing Social Security Act into law. It established insurance for old age and for people who lost their jobs. It ensured compensation for those injured on the job. It guaranteed aid to the needy and disabled, and even children under 18 and single-parent families. It was, she said, a security structure which aims to protect our people against the major hazards of life. It was basically her entire to-do list. She saw it as a turning point in our national life, a turn from careless neglect of human values toward people working together for the common good, hurdling one obstacle after another, boldly speaking up, she transformed the government into a force that helped protect people. On a gigantic scale, she had reached her childhood goal of helping others. I had accomplished what I had come to do, she declared, hoping to return to a quieter life, but FDR valued her too much to accept her resignation. She was at his side from his first day as president to his last day in 1945. In one of their final meetings, he was crying as he grasped her hand. Francis, you've done awfully well. I know what you've been through. I know what you've accomplished. Thank you. After his death, she was finally allowed to resign. She kept working for her causes and lecturing at universities, but out of the public eye. I have a flair for publicity, Francis said. She absolutely refused to write a book about herself. Once she said that seeing her picture in the newspaper nearly kills me. She actually stomped on the camera of one photographer who took her picture despite her pleas not to. So when Frances died after suffering a stroke in 1965 at age 85, not many people remembered who she was and what she had accomplished. Social security, fire safety, workplace regulations, and many of the other laws that keep us safe are things we take for granted, but we should never forget 
the person who made them happen. A shy little girl who cared about others and grew up to protect them. The power of Frances Perkins. Strand by strand, Frances Perkins, 1880 to 1965, helped weave a safety net that protects all Americans to this day. The odds against accomplishing what she did during her era are so high that we have to ask, how in the world did she do it? How did she come to be the only woman in the photo? One factor that helped was a certain amount of luck, being in the right place at the right time. She was able to develop leadership skills at an all-women college at a time when the barriers to higher education for women were just starting to be dropped. The field of social work, a practical way of helping others and fighting for social justice, was also brand new, fostered by women in an ideal direction for her goals. Perkins always insisted that she was a product of women who had influenced her starting with her beloved grandmother. Mary Lyon, 1797 to 1849, the founder of her college, Mount Holyoke, had as her motto, go forward, attempt great things, accomplish great things. Perkins drew inspiration from other women who came before her, such as Ida Tarbell, 1857 to 1944, pioneer of investigative journalism, and Jane Addams, 1860 to 1935, founder of the American profession of social work. But her biggest mentor and cheerleader by far was Florence Kelly, 1859 to 1932 a pioneering social and political reformer. One of Kelly's speeches, said Perkins, first opened my mind to the necessity for and the possibility of the work which became my vocation. Perkins was also aided by the fact that, thanks to her hard work and glowing reputation, she had earned the support powerful man, a president so popular he was elected to four terms in office. For a man of his day, FDR was unusually open-minded toward women, perhaps due to being the son of a strong woman and husband to one of the most revered women in American history, Eleanor Roosevelt. Additionally, she was working towards her goals during a time of severe crisis. The Depression made so many people so desperately poor that it affected a change in the country's ideas about being poor. Poverty wasn't a character flaw, after all. For the first time, many in government saw the need to help. The time was right, but knowing the odds were against her as a woman, Frances also had to cultivate a certain amount of denial about it. Being a woman has only bothered me in climbing trees. As much as possible, she just tried to ignore her gender and focus on her work. She found it helpful to fill a red envelope she called the male mind with notes about how men thought and how she could best make them listen. Her work ethic was amazing, as was her lack of fear. You just can't be afraid if you're going to accomplish anything. Perkins also had the motivation of being the sole support of her husband and her daughter, both of whom had significant health problems. Perhaps above all, it was her voice 
and the striking way she was able to use it that led to her success. Speaking was her superpower. Speaking up for herself and then her others. Frances was a powerful woman, so ahead of her time that many didn't know what to make of her. Combine these elements helped her reach the goals she'd been working for her whole life. It would be another 20 years before another woman joined the president's cabinet. Today, the Department of Labor is housed in a building named for her, where a plaque reads, this building is dedicated to the memory of Frances Perkins, Secretary of Labor, 1933 to 1945, whose legacy of social action enhances the lives of all American workers in wartime and peace, in depression and recovery. She articulated the hopes and dreams of working people and worked untiringly to make those hopes and dreams a reality through the force of her moral courage, intellect, and will. She brought sweeping changes to our national law and practices and forever improved our society. And we've been reading the only woman in the photo Frances Perkins and Her New Deal for America. The book was written by Kathleen Krull and illustrated by Alexandra Bai. The book was published in 2020, and it was published by Athenaeum Books for Young Readers, an imprint of Simon & Schuster Children's Publishing Division. And my name's Mary, and I'm coming to you from the children's room at the Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine.